As we go above just two assets, there are some differences in the way that the optimal portfolio on the Efficient Frontier is identified. So in today's episode, I calculate this in Excel for three assets. Stay tuned. DarwinX is a UK FCA regulated broker and asset manager on a mission to disrupt the financial trading, investing and asset management industries. As a trader, you'll benefit from cost-effective market access via multiple trading platforms and APIs. These enable trading and investing in any US stock, over 60 of the most liquid futures contracts, FX and CFDs. You can even diversify your portfolio by buying and selling other traders' strategies as investable assets themselves. So, if all of that sounds interesting, Learn more by clicking on the link top right now or find further links in the description right below. Now back to today's tutorial. Let's get straight into the calculation of the optimal portfolio for three assets in Excel. So this is where we left the spreadsheet last time and we just calculated what's known as the global minimum variance portfolio. And this is the portfolio construction with these weightings that produces the minimum amount of risk, which you can see highlighted by this yellow point on the chart here. This time we're going to go through a similar process to find an alternative construction, but this time it will be the optimal construction in terms of maximizing the return over risk ratio. So to speed things up, I have a template here that I've pre-prepared and in a similar way to last time, we have different weightings here for the three stocks that we're considering, which is Cisco, Pfizer and Amex. And in a moment, we'll ask the data solver within Excel to optimise these weightings in order to give us that optimal portfolio. So the total here is simply a Excel formula that adds these three values together and we'll be using this as one of the constraints in a moment. Now, we've already calculated the three asset portfolio standard deviation before, so I'm just going to copy that formula and paste it into this new cell here. Likewise, for the three asset portfolio expected daily return, I'll copy that from here. And I won't go through any details of the calculations behind these, but if you are interested, then you'll find that in the previous episodes. Now, just to make sure that these are being calculated correctly, we can highlight that and we can see that that's now using these new three weightings and the relevant metrics that we'd calculated in previous episodes. And just as a reminder, this here is the formula that uses these metrics to produce our portfolio standard deviation. Now, in addition to what we did last time, we also need to introduce what's called a risk-free rate. And this is what you would expect the return to be on a risk-free asset, such as a government bond. And in a moment, we'll subtract this from the expected daily return of the portfolio to give us an excess return. We'll do that all as part of the calculation of the Sharpe ratio. And as I'm sure you're already aware, the Sharpe ratio looks at that excess return that can be achieved in a portfolio and simply divides it by the risk. And this time, it's the sharp ratio that we'll ask the data solver within Excel to maximize. So let's go ahead and complete the formula for this. So it's simply going to be the expected return of the portfolio, and then we're going to subtract the risk-free rate. Now, it's important that we use the daily rate here because we're using a daily return. And then we simply divide that by the risk measured by the standard deviation of the portfolio. And that then gives us our sharp ratio, as you can see. Now, if I manually change the weightings that we have here, so let's just make this 23.3 and we'll make this one 43.3. You'll notice that the standard deviation, expected return and sharp ratio all automatically update based on that new construction of the portfolio. 
And so in a moment, when we ask the data solver to adjust these values automatically for us, again, all of these values will automatically update. And it's this one here, the sharp ratio, that the data solver will be attempting to maximize. So now that we have all of our formulas in place, we can proceed to the data solver. Now, because we used this previously to calculate the global minimum variance portfolio, that's the settings that are currently in place here. But we can reuse and adapt some of these to speed things up today. So if we start with the constraints, if you remember previously, we said that each of the individual weightings needed to be less than or equal to one, representing 100%, and greater than or equal to zero, representing 0%. And so we did that for Cisco, Pfizer, and Amex. And then there's a seventh constraint here, which says that the total, which is this value here, must be equal to one or 100%. And we'll have exactly the same constraints here on the optimized stock portfolio. The only difference is the row. So whereas this was row 263, this is now going to be row 269. So instead of redoing all of these from scratch, I'm simply going to change the row number to 269. And I'll do that for each of the seven. So instead of you watching me do each of these, I'll come back in a moment once I've done all seven. Okay, so they're all now complete. So the next thing we need to do is set our objective function that we're asking the solver to accomplish. And this time we're going to be trying to maximize the sharp ratio, which is that ratio of return over risk. So we select that, but rather than the minimize function we used last time to get the minimum risk, this time we want to maximize the sharp ratio. And the cells that we want solver to change in order to do that, instead of these three up here, it's the three ratios from our new portfolio down here. And that should be everything now complete in order to calculate this optimized stock portfolio. And so we'll click solve in a moment and you should see these three weightings change. And of course, also the other calculated values change. So we can see that a solution has been found, so we'll keep that. And this is rather interesting. So last time to get the minimum variance portfolio, we needed to hold a proportion of all three stocks. But this time to get an optimized portfolio, it's actually saying that we shouldn't be holding Cisco stock at all. Instead, we should hold about 59% of Pfizer stock and 41% of Amex. Now, I think it's worth going back to our original metrics for each of these stocks and thinking why that might be. And straight away, you can see that one of the downsides of Cisco is that it has a very low daily expected return compared to Pfizer and Amex. And although the risk is also less, the difference here is much less than it is for the expected return. And so because our objective function here is to maximize return over risk, it's actually saying don't hold this stock at all. Now that of course won't always be the case and very often you'll have stock portfolios that will say hold a proportion of each of the three assets. But on this occasion, that's not the case. And by holding just these two, we can achieve a daily sharp ratio of 0.1. So let's now go ahead and plot this portfolio onto our minimal variance frontier chart to see where that appears. So to do that, we simply add a new data series, which we'll call our optimal portfolio. And the X values will of course be the risk as measured by the standard deviation, which is this value here. The Y value will be the expected return on a daily basis. And we can just see that a slightly different colored object on the chart has been drawn here, but I'm just going to format that so that it appears a little larger and brighter. Okay, so we now have that 
point here for the optimal portfolio. And as expected, we can see it lies on the efficient frontier, which starts at this point and goes up on this edge we see here. So next time we're going to continue and create what's called the capital allocation line for our three assets. And this will then mark the end of our Excel analysis work. After this, I'll be moving on to the final part of the series, which will look at how we can adapt modern portfolio theory to a day trading and swing trading context. And so, as you know, modern portfolio theory was designed initially for a much longer term investment type context. And so when we move down to a much shorter time frame, when the portfolio is changing much more rapidly, there are a number of considerations and changes we need to perform in order to make that work within this different context. So in all, I'll be spending four episodes talking about those adaptations that are required. So please do remember to give me a like if you've got value from today. But now until next time, trade safe.